The last Lenten candle reminds us once again that as Jesus observed, people love darkness instead of light. For the sake of their own narrow self-interest and in a tragic confusion of darkness and light, good and evil, the people in Jerusalem chose the criminal Barabbas over the preacher Jesus. Luke 23, 13 to 25 tells the story. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. With one voice they cried out, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found him in no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for the insurrection and murder, and the one then asked for and surrendered Jesus to their will. As I recite the response of, or the prayer, please let us reflect as we head into Holy Week. O oh God, in whose grace and glory we have our lives, we come to acknowledge our debt to you. In your self-giving for our salvation, you have demonstrated again and again that you love us. O oh Lord, make us thankful. For the cross of your Son, for the dark days leading up to the cross, and for his love so freely given to us in all persons. O oh Lord, make us thankful. For the Lenten season, when we can recount the loneliness of the garden, the suffering, the shame, and the rejection which our Lord endured for his unfailing faith in, all, in you and all mankind. O oh Lord, make us thankful. Teach us that except we walk through the darkness, we cannot appreciate the light, that except we see the cross clearly, we will not understand the empty tomb, that except we obey even to the point of sacrifice, we cannot truly be your disciples. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. The psalmist writes, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful song. Know that the Lord is God, and is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to the Lord and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. Friends, for generations, our Lord and Savior, the risen Christ, has called those who love him from this community to come into this place, to pray, to sing praises, to hear his word proclaimed. We've heard his voice, we've accepted his invitation, we've come into his house. Let us worship God. Our first hymn, we say we have no sin, that we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is righteous and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us look to the Lord in confession, first silently, and then using the printed prayer. Let us pray. together. 
It is finished. With those words, he declared victory. Sin, death, and evil lost their power. We are a church, each of us recipients of your victory. In Jesus, we have won. But often we deny your victory. We allow sin, evil, and death to reign as if we do not have the Savior. And challenge is our faith. Prophet Jeremiah writes, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of Egypt, because they broke that covenant, even though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel in that day. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least to the greatest, and I will forget their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Amen. Let us remain standing and say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come before you this day. To be able to come into your house at this holy time of year with our brothers and sisters in Christ for fellowship, to pray, to hear your word, and to sing the sacred music. We pray that when we go from this place that we will have been challenged and changed by your word. Lord, we thank you for your light. Make it shine from within us so that we might become bright beacons of hope in this world of shadows. Lord, we ask that you teach us to be a grateful people that all we have and all we are are gifts from you. Help us to remember that every day should be thanksgiving. And Lord, we ask that you overlook our grumbling. Lord, we see, we hear, we read about so many things that disturb us. <coughs> the war in Ukraine, the virus, the plight of the refugees, hunger, shootings, racism, flooding. All over the globe, Lord, there are many people who are hurting and in need. In our own church and community, there are also many people in need of your care. Some needs are physical, some emotional, and some spiritual. We have names of those in need. Many are printed in the bulletin. Some were named aloud. But some whose names are only on our hearts. We ask that you be with all of them, Lord, for with you there is always the promise of restoration. We ask that you be with families that have experienced a loss. Give them your peace and reassure them that the absence is only temporary. We ask that you be with the session of this church as they seek to do your will for your church and this community. We ask that you be with the deacons as they work to spread care and compassion to those inside these doors and out. We ask your blessing on the PNC as they work to find the pastoral leadership that you will call here. We pray for our president, Congress, and other elected leaders. Speak to them and open their eyes and ears that they might lead us in ways that are pleasing to you. And help us to remember that regardless of who our earthly leaders are, that you are the king of all creation. Lord, we ask that you look at our hearts and see beneath our outward appearance 
See your image in each of us. We pray that you remove the blindness that prevents us from recognizing truth so that we might see the world through your eyes and with the compassion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who redeems us. Hear us now as we pray together the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn is not. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, may my words be like your words spoken to the prophet Isaiah. As the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth, making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so it is with the words that go out from my mouth. My they will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purposes for which I sent them. Amen. You know, I, I, that psalm from that passage from Isaiah starts off as the rain and snow come down from heaven. I didn't really expect that to be, you know. <laughs> I don't know, did it snow here this morning? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I thought maybe I lived on the other side of the Arctic Circle because over in Plumville and Switzerland there was an accumulation of snow. Or maybe I, you know, it was in the tropics here. Not quite. Okay, we have two New Testament lessons this morning that are set up about three years apart. The first is early in Jesus' ministry and then the other is Sunday sort of both from the gospel of Luke. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and everyone praised him. He was teaching in their synagogues. News about him had spread around the countryside. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to preach, to proclaim freedom for the prisoner, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Everybody spoke well of him and was amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus continued, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal thyself. And do here in your hometown what we heard you did in Capernaum. For I assure you that no prophet is accepted in his hometown. For I can assure you there were many widows in Israel during the time of Elijah, Elijah the prophet, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine over the land. But Elijah was sent to none of them, but to a widow in Zarephath, in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy during the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was healed. Only Naaman, Syrian. The people were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the synagogue, and led him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he made his way through the crowd and went on his way. Fast forward three years. After he had said this, Jesus continued on to Jerusalem. As he approached the Beth page of Bethany, where the hill goes up the Mount of Olives, or the road goes up the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the town ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, one on which no one has ever ridden. Untie it. Bring it here. If anyone says to you, Why are you untying the colt? Say to them, The Lord needs it. The two who were sent ahead went and found things just as Jesus had said. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? The Lord needs it. They brought it to him, 
put their cloaks on it and set Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road ahead of him. As he approached the place where the road goes down the middle of the walls, the entire crowd of disciples began to shout and praise God in a loud voice for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd began to rebuke him. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus said, truly I tell you, if they keep quiet, the very stones will cry out. <coughs> to the glory of God, this is the word of the Lord. Luke's account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem at the time of the Passover, what we refer to as the beginning of Holy Week, is well known. With minor differences, all four Gospels tell the story of the triumphal entry. Jesus was preaching, teaching, and healing out in the hinterlands for up to three years, and now he has become well known. And now many are waiting for him to make his move. To go to Jerusalem and take control, to overthrow the occupying Roman forces and restore Israel to the glory days, not seen since the time of King David a thousand years before. Even though Jesus' preaching and teaching dealt primarily with taking care of the poor, the widows, the crippled, the outcasts, the crowds were expecting a mighty warrior. And what better time for him to take control than at the Passover? This is a time when patriotism and national fervor were at its highest, and maybe a million Jews were congregating on Jerusalem to commemorate their freedom from another hated empire, the Egyptians. And although the Romans permitted the Jews to maintain their religious identity, it had to be a time of great tension for those charged with keeping the peace. So there has to be some disappointment for the masses when Jesus and his ragtag bag of, band of followers enter town on a donkey or colt, depending on which uh, gospel you're reading, the, sing the symbol of a king coming in peace, not one ready for war. But some of them may have remembered the words of the prophet Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. They can hope that this is the promised Messiah preparing to throw off the Roman shackles. So maybe this donkey, maybe this is a ruse, a bluff, to, not so as to not antagonize the Romans who would be quick to bring down the hammer on any disturbance that might lead to some sort of uprising. They'd done it before. The Romans' intolerance for rebellion was well known. Destroying towns and villages and putting suspected revolutionaries to death, leaving their body on crosses for weeks or months as grim reminders not to mess with the power of Rome. So Jesus enters the city leading a loud procession, accepting the adulation of the crowd, surely basking in their praises, their singing, and their hope, knowing all the while that he has less than a week to live. The crowd is cheering, throwing their garments on the road before him like a red carpet. The palm branches they're waving, although that's not in Luke's account, those are symbols of national pride, like flag or terrible towel. This Procession is the culmination of years of admiration, joy, thanks, and reverence coming to fruition. And Jesus himself acknowledges that the very stones are ready to cry out in praise if for any reason the people were silenced. Meanwhile, however, somewhere else in the city there's another procession, and this one is not so, quite so warm and fuzzy. In a city and at a time ripe for revolt, the Romans put on a show of their own. Pontius Pilate was governor of that area, but he didn't live in Jerusalem. He made his home in the resort town Caesarea by the sea, but he certainly needed to be in Jerusalem at the Passover to put on a show of force. Instead of warm smiles and palms waving and children laughing and running, Pilate's entry was designed to instill fear and respect. In his magnificent history of the American Revolution, named titled 1776, Pittsburgh native and historian David McCullough describes the scene in London on October 26, 1775, as King George III rides to the Palace of Westminster to address Parliament on the growing threat of revolt in the American colonies. McCullough describes the king's procession, horsemen with swords drawn to clear the way, 
coaches filled with nobility, the horse guards and yeomen of the guard decked out in red and gold splendor, then a rank of footmen, finally the king in his golden chariot pulled by eight cream-colored horses with footmen to either side. Twenty-four feet in length and thirteen feet high, the royal coach weighed nearly four tons, enough to make the ground tremble as it passed by. The English knew that no mortal on earth rode in such splendor as their king. It was as, as if the very grandeur and wealth and weight of the British Empire were rolling past McCullough writes, an empire that stretched from Canada and the American colonies to the shores of India, an empire not to be messed with. Pilate's entry into Jerusalem might not have been quite as magnificent, but the intent was the same, don't mess with Rome. Instead of gently approaching the city on a donkey, Pilate would have been surrounded by soldiers on foot and horseback with armor and bronze helmets, swords, spears, and bows. Drummers would have been beat out a cadence to the march. And I'll guarantee nobody waved palms. While Pilate's procession was intended to display the strength of the Roman Empire, Jesus' entry was designed to showcase the peace and tranquility that God brings to his people. And it would have been obvious to any onlooker which leader had the hearts of the people. The gentle carpenter from Nazareth who probably never brandished a sword in his life. Yet barely four days later, the same adoring crowds have either switched allegiances or get drowned out by crowds, louder cries of, crucify him. What happened? How did they either turn on him or desert him in such a short period of time? Was Jesus Lord of their lives or just king for a day? We humans can be very fickle, switching a light allegiance and favor at the drop of a hat, particularly when it comes to our leaders, those we choose to follow. We can jump on a politician's bandwagon, love the things they say and promise, yet once they're in office and they have to act instead of just speak, we often don't like that. Most actions that a leader takes make somebody angry, and if it's my ox that's getting gored, I can find somebody else to, to follow. The 41st president of the United States, George Bush, was one of the most successful politicians in the 20th century. In his first three national elections, two as Reagan's running mate, and once for president on his own, the team that Bush was on won 133 of a possible 150 states in the three elections. As president in January 1991, Bush had a popularity rating of 89%, among the highest ever recorded by an American president. Yet once the flag waving over the liberation of Kuwait was over, Bush lost the 92 election with 38% of the vote. It happened to Jesus too, and it only took a few days. And it wasn't the first time that it happened to him. In the first story we heard, Jesus is just beginning his public ministry. And it's where he should be among family and friends in his hometown of Nazareth. He's given the honor of reading scripture during a Sabbath service. And once he's read Isaiah's description of the qualities of a Messiah, Jesus informs the crowd that he is the fulfillment of that prophecy. And they're not offended. They're not taken back, but they're rather proud that he's one of them. Hometown boy made good, they're thinking. Why, well, that's Joseph's son. I've known him all my life. Live just down the street from us. Always such a polite young man. But the adoration and praise stops as soon as Jesus begins to speak. The crowd isn't ready for his message of grace. They wanted a king who would pat them on the back and tell them how wonderful they were and how special they were to be God's chosen people. A king who had blessings and privileges only for his favorites. The rest of the world can wait. But that's not what Jesus was telling them. Instead, he told them stories from Scripture that they surely knew, but pretended not to. He recounted times that God's grace and mercy had been ex extended to foreigners, not to the Jews. And they're not going to stand for garbage like that from this young upstart. Who does he think he is? Some kind of big shot? We'll put a stop to this before he can get started. He's getting too big for his britches. And they push him to the edge of town to throw him off the cliff. But he escapes. For now. Now, three years later, Jesus again arrives to adoring crowds. And again, this time in a few days, the cheers of the crowd are replaced by calls to kill him. What could he have possibly done to turn the crowds against him? 
Just prior to the story of the triumphal entry, Luke records that the people thought the kingdom of God was going to appear all at once. Maybe it's what Jesus didn't say. You know, right now we're just about five days from April 15th. Probably one of your favorite days of the year, income tax day. How would we respond to a politician who promises to lower taxes or eliminate them, and then once he's in office, raise them? Remember what I said about President Bush? The analysts say the reversal of his no new taxes pledge is what destroyed his approval rating. I don't know if that's a case about with Jesus, but the people hated paying taxes to the Romans. And what did Jesus have to say about that? He seems to have surprised them. You know, they asked him if it was legal to pay tax to Caesar. He didn't seem to focus on taxes. He wasn't concerned. And now they're trying to trap him with that question. And he doesn't fall into the trap. He brushes the question off. He said, pay them. He says they have nothing to do with what we owe God. Or maybe after entering the city, the fact that he continued to tell parables about the kingdom of God, rather than leading a revolt, made the people realize this wasn't the king that they had anticipated. Mark records that after first entering the city, surrounded by his followers, Jesus looked around. And since it was pretty late, he left. That's not what the people expected. By this point, it's pretty obvious that his message of peace and love and charity had nothing to do with kicking the Romans out of the country, but defeating the power of sin in our lives. Could it be because they wanted an instant kingdom and he offered them an eternal kingdom? Or simply when during the week they saw the demands of his kingdom and they weren't willing to change their lives for him? Jesus led a revolt for sure, and he did defeat the enemy, not the Romans, but the enemies of sin and death. The triumphal entry invites us to re-examine our understanding of the mission of Jesus and our commitment to him. As we see the adoring crowd slink away as the week becomes more difficult and those who oppose him become bolder, which side do we see ourselves on? Maybe we need to ask ourselves, have we made him king for a day or Lord of our lives? Thanks be to God. Thank you for letting us share our worship service with you today. We invite you to join us in person next Sunday at 1030, or if you prefer, to listen online Sunday afternoon. If you would like to make a donation, please visit our website at www.marionpress.org and click the Donate Now button. May God bless you and have a great week.